okay so this is the second lecture on uh, diagonalization in the first lecture we had discussed about what eigen values eigen vectors are how to find them um <clears throat> quest certain questions regarding their existence what is the characteristic polynomial of a matrix or a linear a linear operator okay so we'll continue those discussions so this is the so this is the second lecture on eigen values and eigen vectors right and eigen vectors okay <coughs> okay so the thing certain things which we had concluded in the in the previous lecture were of the form that suppose a is a matrix a is a n cross n matrix matrix and c is a is an eigen value is an eigen value of a right then we had that determinant of a minus c i and suppose this is the polynomial f a of x so this must be zero right f of f a of c must be zero right so this we have discussed in the previous lecture this polynomial with an identifier x is called a characteristic polynomial so <coughs> so f a x was called the characteristic polynomial right yeah now observe one thing suppose the underlying field is algebraically closed okay we assume that so that uh, we are clear about the existence of the eigen values okay so if the uh, characteristic sorry if the underlying field is uh, is algebraically closed then the polynomial characteristic polynomial this breaks into <coughs> linear factors right so we can write this as x minus c1 to the power some d1 x minus c2 to the power some d2 and so on till suppose x minus cn to the power sorry d ck let's say to the power dk okay <clears throat> and each c1 c2 till ck are the eigen values of a right this we know where each ci is an eigen value of now obviously to observe that the roots that are that, that are these eigen values they appear in the multiplicities of the power of their factors right this we know in solving the equations solving polynomial equations we have prior knowledge to that that is if i list down the eigen values of this polynomial of, of this matrix as roots of this polynomial then they come out as c1 c1 so this appears d1 times right then c2 will appear d2 times and so on till you have then ck appearing c dk times right dk times and since this polynomial is of n degree because the <coughs> matrix is an n cross n matrix <coughs> so total number of roots must be n right total number of roots equal n right so that means now what are the total number of roots so total number so you have d1 roots here then you have d2 roots and so you have a total of summation of di roots right so i equals to 1 to k so this must be equal to n right <coughs> right yeah now each di so this is sort of a definition each di is defined or rather i should say or called the algebraic multiplicity the algebraic multiplicity <coughs> uh, or called the algebraic multiplicity of ci okay so the multiplicity of the eigen values as root of the characteristic polynomial is called the algebraic multiplicity of it so let us go through a quick example 
because we i think we have not discussed uh, even one of one example so let us just come to an example so let a be the matrix 5 minus 6 minus 6 minus 1 4 2 3 minus 6 minus 4 then observe that a minus xi this polynomial is of this form right so it's 5 minus x minus 6 minus 6 minus 1 4 minus x 2 and 3 minus 6 and minus 4 minus x right so this will on solving it will come out to be of this form so x minus 1 times x minus 2 whole square right therefore algebraic multiplicity of 1 is 1 because the power is 1 here and algebraic multiplicity of 2 is Right. This is a fair observation. Okay. Now, now, we had also come up to the fact that if C is an eigenvalue, is an eigenvalue of a matrix A, which is n cross n, let's say, then the eigenspace the eigenspace say w the eigenspace w which is the which is the collection of all eigenvectors uh, of a associated associated with c has dimension has dimension equal to nullity of right nullity of a minus c i right this we had established in the previous now we know what nullity specifically is when a matrix is given right so it's the number of non zero rows in its row reduced echelon form right so just recall recall for a matrix for a matrix a the nullity of A is defined as or it's it's equal to let's say because that's not an exact definition. We have concluded that, right? Nullity of A is the number of is the number of non-zero rows in its row reduced echelon form. The row reduced echelon form. If I just give a brief uh, brief hint to why it happens so because what is the range of this matrix right? what is the rank of this matrix if i be precise so if you consider the equation a x equal to 0 right so this is the exact null space of this 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 should be the exact null space of the matrix right consisting of these these vectors x right so and we know that a x equal to 0 so this uh, this system of suppose let me let me be a bit more precise so so we need to find what is the null space of this matrix. Right? So it's it's obviously, suppose you consider x in the null space of it, then that means a x equal to zero. Right? So what will be the dimension of x? So the dimension of x will precisely be the number of non-zero rows. Right? Because in a system of linear equations, what happens? The number of non-zero rows that exactly leads to the number of uh, number of uh, you might say independent identifiers, right? The number of non-zero rows corresponding, uh, you know, they correspond to those variables which can take arbitrarily any value. And variables which take arbitrarily any value, they are used to determine the whole space, right? Because if the matrix of this form, let's say, so it, it is R1 row, R2 row, and then you have three zero rows, times you have X1, X2, and so on till X5, equals to if you have of this form, then the zero rows corresponding to x3, x4, x5. So x3, x4, x5 can arbitrarily take any values. So x3, x4, x5 can take any values. And x1 and x2, which correspond to the non-zero rows, they will completely depend on these uh, independent or rather these free variables. Okay, x3, x4, x5. So x3, x4, and x5, they completely determine the space which consists of those column vectors which correspond to this equation. Right? 
and that exactly means that these arbitrary values or rather i could say these free variables span the null space of it so obviously the nullity of this should be the number of non zero rows and obviously in its row reduced echelon form right because an arbitrary matrix in an arbitrary matrix we cannot speak about zero rows right we need to get it to the row reduced echelon form because the row reduced echelon form gives you the number of linearly independent rows and the zero rows right so that's it that's very basic uh, hint to it i guess it's clear okay so obviously so this is this is pretty clear from the from what we just discussed that therefore we can say that dimension of the eigen space eigen space w which corresponds to the eigen value c corresponds to the eigen value c equals number of Uh, non-zero rows in the row-reduced echelon form of A minus C I, right? Okay. So now, having discussed this, observe one thing before we move on to further discussions. The observation is that suppose you have, let's say, you have uh, you have K. distinct eigen values let's say you have k distinct eigen values okay you have k distinct eigen values and corresponding to these distinct eigen values you have k eigen spaces okay so c1 with respect to c1 you have the eigen space w1 with respect to c2 you have the eigen space w2 and with respect to ck you have the eigen space wk now each eigen space consists of vectors from the uh, from the vector space on which the linear operator is defined right because if you remember so since the start of this lecture we are obviously discussing with with respect to matrices but we know that every matrix is associated with a with a linear operator right linear operator defined on some vector space and for obvious reasons we are discussing about finite dimensional vector spaces so we can obviously talk about basis of that or dimension of that vector space right so what we are trying to say is that each wi consists of vectors from the vector space vector space v on whom sorry on whom on which sorry on which a linear operator is defined say t and the matrix we started our discussion with we started our discussion with can be thought of can be thought of as the as the uh, matrix associated with associated with p yeah, so this quote and quote clear now suppose that the dimension of w1 is d1 okay dimension of w2 is d2 and so on till say dimension of w k is dk such that the sum of these di's I equals to one to k is equals to n, and which is the suppose the dimension of t. Okay, got it. Now, if the dimension of w one is some d one, then obviously w one w one consists of some basis, right? So let b one be the basis of w, or let's let's say b i be the basis of basis of w i. So b i also consists of vectors from. the vector space okay. now my question is that suppose i arrange each vector or rather i should say each basis element from each wi in columns and form a matrix so that matrix will obviously be a n cross n matrix because each bi will consist of di number of 
uh, elements right and the total number of such elements will equal n which is equal to the dimension of v and dimension of v is equal to n right that that's uh, we started our discussion with right so the matrix we will get will be an n cross n matrix because if i form this basis b or rather i should say rather let me speak about this 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 uh, subset of v let's say so b is equals to say b1 b2 till bn we form this very set okay now since each bi is a basis of each wi so they are mutually linearly independent right they are mutually linearly independent that's pretty obvious from the fact because they form basis of a of a subspace right i think it, it's it's obvious okay now we will use it as a claim or we will prove it later that this b will also form a basis of v okay that is this b consists of linearly independent elements they b1 b2 till bn are all linearly independent but for this moment let us just assume that b is a linearly independent set okay b is a linearly independent set <coughs> now if b is a linearly independent set and it consists of exactly n vectors okay it consists of exactly n vectors then b is a then that implies b is a basis of v right b is a basis of v right? is it clear so under matrix representation under matrix representation since we had defined all, uh, you know these concepts regarding matrices as well where we had discussed that the vectors are specifically column vectors okay. so if i form the matrix p which consists of column vectors column vectors of uh, column vectors of each basis element of wi okay that is if wi is the eigen space of ci eigen space of ci having a basis having a basis bi then in terms of matrices this wi consists of column vectors only right so it is spanned by certain number of column vectors so if i relate this concept with these statements i wrote then the space wi is spanned by bi number of column vectors so we choose those column vectors arrange them in columns obviously to form the matrix p and the matrix p will obviously be an n cross n square matrix just because the total number of column vectors we will eventually get from taking uh, the basis elements from each of these eigen spaces will be equal to n right so that will specifically mean that p is a n cross n square matrix square matrix and let and we write p as let p be written as so let me write it as let's say you know alpha 1 alpha 2 till alpha so each alpha represents the columns of right? okay. now my question is what is a what is a when a is the matrix we started our discussion with that is each wi consists of the eigen spaces of the matrix a associated with a certain eigen value ci okay. then ap is nothing but a times this matrix right alpha 1 alpha 2 till alpha n. but this can be written as a alpha 1 a alpha 2 till a alpha n but a alpha 1 by definition of an eigen value eigen vector is basically c1 alpha 1 right then it's some c2 alpha 2 let's say till some cn alpha n but obviously in this list we are not concerned about them being distinct or them being similar that is some ci might be equal to some cj right because we are no more concerned about the eigen values being distinct because here each individual component of the basis elements are written individually right? therefore 
So let me just uh, change the index here. So let this be C1, C2 till C10. Okay. That is what is actually happening. Suppose, let me just give a brief example. Suppose alpha 1 and alpha 2 both belong to W1. Right. Then C1 and C2 both equal C1 let's say. That is the only thing which we are talking about. Right? But this can be written as, observe, this can be written as this column matrix alpha 1, alpha 2 till alpha n times this identity matrix. Sorry, this diagonal matrix which is C1, C2 till Cn. Right? This is 0 and this is 0. So, this is equals to P times a diagonal matrix D where D equals the diagonal matrix C1, sorry, C1, C2 till Cn. But that implies A equals to P D P inverse or D equals to P inverse A P. Right? So, that means A is diagonalizable. A is diagonalizable. Therefore, the conclusion which we draw from here is that if the sum of the dimensions of all the eigenspaces we have of all possible eigenvalues of the matrix A equal the dimension of the vector space, underlying vector space, or rather you can talk about the dimension of the matrix A as well. Therefore, conclusion conclusion if the sum of the dimension dimensions of all the eigenspaces equal the dimension of the matrix A then A is diagonalized a is diagonalizable, right? Because we will get n linearly independent vectors. We have not yet proven the fact that this basis collection, which consists of the uh, columns coming from the basis element of each eigenspace, is are linearly independent. We will prove that, and proving that will lead us to an, you know, an extremely convenient condition to check whether a matrix is diagonalizable or not, right? Okay. So, before moving on to this, let us just, um, let me just analyze a few facts, okay. Suppose, suppose V, uh, v over F is a finite dimensional vector space, okay. Suppose V over F is a finite dimensional vector space and let B be this basis, say alpha 1, alpha 2, the alpha n be an ordered basis be an ordered basis of um, of v let t be a linear operator defined on v such that t of alpha i equals to c i alpha i then from the knowledge of the matrix representation of a linear operator, it is pretty obvious to notice that the matrix representation of T with respect to the basis B is this diagonal matrix, right? So, it's C1, C2, Cn and all of these are 0, right? And this is the exact thing which we just discussed, right? That if you have a linear operator of this form, then, then B is just the, you know, collection of all the basis elements from the eigenspaces, if you relate it what we, with what we discussed right now. This statement basically means that if such a condition arises, then we will eventually get a diagonal matrix. That is what we have here. Okay. 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 Now, so basically our goal is, our goal is that observe the following statements because these are certain conclusions which we have already drawn that if t is diagonalizable if t is diagonalizable then there exists a there exists an ordered basis 
ordered basis of V such that order basis of V say B such that the matrix of T with respect to B is a diagonal matrix. Further, if B is a basis formed out of linearly independent eigenvectors, linearly independent eigenvectors is a basis of V formed out of linearly independent eigenvectors, then T is diagonalizable or rather I can say that T, suppose this is V1, then T with respect to B1 is again a diagonal matrix. So our goal is to just, you know, claim that B1 is equals to B. That is the basis formed using the eigenvectors is eventually that very basis which we want whose matrix associated, I mean the matrix represented in the linear transform associated with, with, with that uh, basis will be a diagonal matrix. That is what we actually want to speak, right? And since we already know that if we get such a linearly independent set, then the diagonalization is pretty obvious because of the, because of what we discussed previously, right? Because here we obviously notice that if we have a collection, a linearly independent collection, which equals the dimension of, of the vector space consisting of eigenspaces, then diagonalization is pretty obvious from simple manipulation of this, right? So we only need to claim that if we have n linearly independent eigen, uh, you know, sorry, if we have n, um, suppose some k eigenspaces, then we choose the elements of the basis of each of those eigenspaces. And if that number of elements equal n, then they form a basis of V. Right? So that is only the our only claim. So definition. Or I cannot come up with this definition. Let me just come up with this. Yeah. Sorry. So lemma. Let T be a linear operator on a vector space. V on a vector space V, let C be an eigenvalue of T and alpha be its corresponding eigenvector. Okay. Then for all polynomials in fx so f is the underlying field of the vector space so if f is the under uh, if uh, then for all polynomials in fx f of t of alpha is equals to f of c of alpha okay so let's prove this <coughs> okay so so let f f of x be a0 plus a1x and so on till a n x, a n x to the power x. Then what is f of t? So f of t is nothing but a0 times t to the power 0, we assume t to the power 0 to be the identity transformation, plus a1t plus a2t squared and so on till a n t to the power n. Then obviously this is a, a mapping, right? So we need to define this with respect to some alpha or some vector. So what is f of t of alpha? So f of t of alpha is basically a0 i of alpha plus a1 t of alpha plus a2 t squared of alpha and so on till a n t to the power n of alpha. Now before moving on first observe that, observe that what is t squared of alpha where alpha is Obviously, an eigenvector corresponding to the an eigenvalue C. The T square of alpha is T times T of alpha. Sorry, T of T of alpha. But T of alpha is C alpha. So, it's T of C times alpha. C is a scalar, right? So, it comes out by properties of a linear operator. So, it's C times T alpha. But T alpha is again C alpha. So, it's C squared alpha. Right? So, inductively, inductively, if some T to the power R of 
alpha is equals to c to the power r of alpha then d to the power 1 uh, r plus 1 of alpha is equal to d to the power r of p alpha but that's exactly t to the power r of c times alpha c comes outside or rather uh, let me do it in this way so let me write it as t to the power r plus 1 of alpha as t to the power r sorry t times t to the power r alpha okay and t to the power r of alpha is c to the power r alpha so it's t times c to the power r alpha so c to the power r comes out here because that's obviously a scalar value so it's c to the power r times t to the p alpha but it's again c alpha so it's c to the power r plus 1 so inductively obvious that t to the power n alpha is equals to c to the power n times alpha okay therefore one implies that f of t of alpha so since alpha is an eigen vector corresponding to the eigen value c so this a0 times alpha plus a1 c alpha plus a2 c squared alpha and so on till an c to the power n alpha but alpha can be brought outside right so it becomes a0 plus a1 c and so on till an c to the power n whole multiplied with alpha but this is nothing but f of c by definition of f right so we have proved the fact right okay. so let us move on to the next proposition proposition let t be a linear operator on v where v over f is a finite dimensional vector space let c1 c2 till ck be the only distinct eigen values of t let wi be the eigen space associated with the eigen value ci okay then let w be the sum of these spaces okay w1 till wk then the dimension of w is the is the sum over the dimensions of each individual space so dimension of w is basically summation over i is equals to 1 to k dimension of each w i s right in fact if beta 1 b2 till bk are the ordered basis are the ordered basis of w1 w2 till wk respectively respectively then the base uh, the set formed with each individual element b1 b2 till bk is the ordered basis of w Clear? Clear? Okay. Okay. So let's come up with a proof of it. Proof. Okay. okay. So yeah, we can prove it of this sort. Let's say, so given W is equals to W one plus W two till W k. Okay. Let zero is equals to beta one plus beta two, and so on till beta k, such that beta i each beta i is from W one. Okay. Let f x. be a polynomial over f then what is f of t of 0 
so f of t of 0 is basically f of t of this value right so it's a beta 1 and so on till beta k okay? but this is basically f of t of beta 1 plus f of t of beta 2 and so on till f of t of beta k but f of t of beta 1 by our previous lemma is f of c1 times beta 1 because each beta i is an eigenvalue associated with the eigenvector uh, sorry it is an eigenvector associated with the eigenvalue c1 so this plus this is plus uh, f of c2 times beta 2 and so on till f of c n times or f of c k times beta k right and this happens for all polynomials f this happens for all f in fx right so therefore in particular in particular a polynomial so if so since this happens for all all polynomials f so in particular there can exist a polynomial such that f i of x is given as f i of c of j is equals to delta i j right so if i use this polynomial over over here then a what is f of t of, uh, t of 0 then that is summation over i is equals to uh, 1 to k sorry j is equals to 1 to k f of i c of j times beta j but f j c j is equals to 1 right because this is 1 if i equals to j and this is 0 if i not equals to j then every other uh, term will cancel out because they will become 0 and you are only left with the term f j c j but f j c f j of c j is 1 so this is equal to beta j right equal to beta j so what does this imply so this implies beta j must be equal to 0 right beta j must be equal to 0 okay. because because this equals 0 right this equals 0 yeah so f of t of 0 because 0 equals this so f f is such a polynomial such that f of t of 0 equals 0 right f of t of 0 equals 0 we can obviously assume that right we can obviously consider a polynomial such that this happens and this is a polynomial which exactly obeys this condition right so this means b j will be 0 and since j is arbitrary j is an arbitrary index since j is an arbitrary index therefore so that implies that so each beta j becomes 0 right so if each beta j becomes 0 then we have successfully claimed the fact that the dimension of w is nothing but dimension of w1 and so on till dimension of w k right Okay, let us just more emphasize on this fact a bit more. Let me not immediately write this down. Okay, so each beta j concludes, we conclude that each beta j comes out to this. Now, let dimension of wj be dj. Okay, j equals to 1 to k, j is 1 to k. Let bj be the set of elements alpha of i plus 1 alpha i plus 2 till alpha i plus dj okay where i ranges over s equal to 1 to j minus 1 ds clear okay we claim that b is equals to b1 b2 till bk which is clearly equals to alpha 1, alpha 2 till alpha n is linearly independent. Clear? Clear? Okay. So let us come up with this because this will automatically prove the fact we have. Okay. So okay. Yeah. So suppose not. 
suppose not then w1 plus w2 till w k equals 0 where each w i is a linear combination of basis elements of capital w i because each w i is an element from capital w i so hence it's a linear combination of the basis elements of capital w i right but if that happens but if that happens that if therefore if w i w j is written as summation over k j times alpha j then this will obviously mean suppose this is star then star implies that each k j must be 0 right for all j but if each k j is equals to 0 then that would imply that each w j will become 0 that is not quite possible right therefore b must be the basis that implies b is the basis of w right? and if b is the basis of w then that automatically implies that the dimension of w is equal to sum over the dimension of each w i i equals to 1 to right? okay so having this proposition in our hand and the initial discussion which with which we started this uh, this very lecture from there we can obviously conclude the following theorem that let t be a linear operator on a finite dimensional vector space v let c1 c2 till ck be the distinct eigenvalues of t and let wi be the null space of t minus c i times the identity operator that is wi is the eigenspace is the eigenspace associated with the eigenvalue c Uh, C i, then the following are equivalent. Number one, T is diagonalizable. T is diagonalizable. Number two, the characteristic polynomial for T, the characteristic polynomial for T is of the form f equals to x minus c1 to the power r1, x minus c2 to the power r2 and so on till x minus ck to the power rk with, with dimension of wi is equals to ri for all i is equals to 1 to k. Number 3 dimension of w1 so on till dimension of wk equals to dimension of u. Now obviously notice that if the algebraic multiplicity of each uh, of, of each of the eigenvalues equals r1 then we know if algebraic now this set of statements are quite uh, trivial right from the from what we just proved as a proposition and the initial discussions we started with. moving into a bit more and ana analyzing this question gives us the following thing that if r i is the algebraic multiplicity of of c i then the sum over these algebraic multiplicities i equals to 1 to k okay, this will obviously equal n where n is the dimension of v because we had previously discussed about this because uh, f must be an n, uh, n degree polynomial the characteristic polynomial of t must be an n degree polynomial where n is the dimension of v it's trivial by the definition so summation of these ris must be equal to n therefore if the dimension 
of W i becomes R i, then that would imply that summation over the dimensions of W i will be equal to summation of uh, uh, summation over R i is uh, i equals to 1 to k. Here is also i equals to 1 to k. But that will equal the dimension of V. And the previous proposition gives us the fact that this typically is the third statement in this in this theorem and it eventually gives us it eventually gives us a basis which consists of basis elements from each of the eigenspaces right from the previous theorem right each of the eigenspaces from the previous theorem so this eventually means that if the basis of v consists of n column elements or rather i should say n elements from e, uh, from the respective eigenspaces of v then we can diagonalize the operator t, right? This was the uh, this of uh, this was our initial uh, discussion. Right? Therefore, the only thing which we need to check whether to check whether a, a linear given linear operator or given a square matrix is diagonalizable is no, uh, diagonalizable or not is just to check whether the algebraic multiplicity of a certain eigenvalue and the uh, nullity of t minus c i are same or not okay so let me just give a brief definition that for a given eigenvalue c c of a linear operator t on a finite dimensional vector space v nullity of t minus c capital i is defined as the geometric multiplicity geometric multiplicity of c and this exactly equals the dimension of its eigenspace now we in the previous theorem we encountered the fact that dimension of wi is equals to the algebraic multiplicity of ci this implies that t is diagonalizable is diagonalizable okay okay so that means we just need to check whether the algebraic multiplicity of ci equals the geometric multiplicity of ci and that is what whatever we exactly need to check whether a linear operator is diagonalizable or not okay so we end this lecture now in the next lecture we will be discussing about examples examples related to diagonalization which will be in relevance with whatever we discussed in this lecture and in the previous lecture with diagonalization okay and concluding the fact concluding the fact that if t is diagonalizable that if t is diagonalizable then all these all these or trivially hold that is the theorem we just stated all those points in the theorem trivially hold i have a lecture on annihilating polynomials in this playlist of linear algebra where i have also discussed this thing that if t is diagonalizable then these things trivially hold you can view that lecture as well to have a clear discussion but eventually we will be discussing a little bit on this topic that will exactly uh, you know uh, conclude that the theorem is true that is eventually it will give us a proof of the theorem because notice that notice in the theorem we have proved that 3 implies 1 right we have proved 3 implies 1 we have eventually proved 2 implies 1 the only thing which we are left to do is 1 implies 2 and 2 implies uh, and 1 implies 3 that will prove the 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 thing that these statements are equivalent so in the le next lecture we will start with our discussion on what happens if t is diagonalizable and that's pretty easy to analyze you can in fact do it on your own as well that if t is diagonalizable then these things automatically hold okay but still we will be having a short discussion of that okay so so that's all for today meet you guys in the next lecture